A pleasant good morning to everybody. Good morning. Last week we uh, did talk about bringing heaven a little closer to earth. So um, this morning we are somehow adding to that, continuing on with uh, that lesson on bringing heaven a little closer to God by we are we will be talking about the good samaritan and uh, we will have a uh, well probably i guess most of us or all of us here uh, know the story of the uh, the good samaritan but i think uh, you will get a uh, few learnings from this morning with regards to the uh, Good Samaritan. Okay. Now let me read to you the uh, whole account of the Good Samaritan as part of the scripture reading. And that is in Luke uh, chapter 10, verses 25 down to 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus and he said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on or passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near to him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Then the next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to an innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Now, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Jesus. And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The story of the Good Samaritan, a popular story among Christians. And uh, these are the characters. Let's just look uh, over the characters, the lawyer, uh, Jesus, the Jewish man who got robbed, <clears throat> excuse me, the robbers, the priest, the Levite, a Samaritan, and the innkeeper. So those were the characters in the, uh, the Good Samaritan story. So what are the lessons that we could get from this account? Number one is faith without works is dead also. James chapter 2, verse 24. Now, in the account of the Good Samaritan from verses 25 to 28, okay, the, uh, the lawyer asked Jesus Christ, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus at the end, he said, do this and you will live. You see, brethren and friends, faith is definitely a must for every professing Christian. Right? We must have faith in the Lord. It is, in fact, written in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So all of us need to have that faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But the question is, what kind of faith you and I must have? 
What kind of faith? And Jesus explicitly tells us what kind of faith that you and I must have. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What does it mean? Faith that must be obedient to God. Faith, according to James, must couple with action. And according to James, as we have read a while ago, faith without work is dead. Again, it is important for all of us to have faith in the Lord. It is important for us to put our faith in action. That's why, again, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And many people love the Lord Jesus Christ. I can tell you that. I can tell you that. If you come up to a person and ask that person, do you know and do you love Jesus Christ? And they will say yes. Definitely. 99.99% .99 will say yes. I love the Lord. I believe in God. But if you will observe how they live, it's the other way around. That's why Jesus said, your faith must be an obedient faith that obeys whatever he asks you to do. And that is faith. Now, Jesus said to this, uh, to this lawyer, do, go and do likewise. So God wants this man to have his faith be seen in his actions. Now, the lawyer, he knew his theology. He knew it very well. In fact, he, he, he gave the right answer. That's why Jesus said, uh, there was a compliment actually by Jesus said. Jesus said to him, you're right. You have given the right answer. So this lawyer knew very well his theology. Now the problem is the lawyer does not do what exactly the scripture tells him to do. Again, that's why Jesus said to him, do, uh, do this and you will live. Now many self-professing Christians until this very moment where that they know our Lord Jesus Christ. They have in our Lord Jesus Christ. But again, unfortunately, their actions, you know, their, their mouths, their hearts is far from what Christianity is all about. Now, it is a wonderful sight, especially like this day, every Sunday. Every Sunday. It's a wonderful sight to see people, you know, going to congregate, going to different churches to worship the Lord. As, uh, as I pass by the, the white road going here, I can see many churches and many people are going inside the churches, which is actually a good sight. It's a wonderful sight to behold. But the sad part of this is, is that, you know, we are not living in accordance to what our faith dictates. And many people, according to Jesus Christ, these people drew or draw near to me. In Matthew chapter 15, 8 and 9, that's why Jesus said, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me. Matthew 15, 8 and 9. Now, we, we boast ourselves of knowing the gospel. You see, we have so, we have so many, many verses to throw at people. We proclaim... All right, thank you. And we proclaim with our lips that, you know, praise God. Hallelujah. Right? Every Sunday, people go to church. But Jesus said, you know, their hearts, your heart is far from me. Their hearts are far from me. And in vain, they worship me. Why? Why is that? Because Jesus can see right through all of us. Jesus can see right through our hearts, right through your hearts. Even if you are right here, this very moment, sitting right there. Jesus can see right through you. Even if I am here standing in front of you, Jesus can see right through me. If I am really worshiping God, if you are really worshiping God, 
in all spirit and in all truth? Or are we just sitting here trying to, you know, pass the time? That's why Jesus said they worship God in vain because their lives are given to the pattern of this world. Many Christians holding up the Bible, many Christians are telling they knew God, they go to church every Sunday, but after, just after leaving the church, you can see their life. They go back again to their sinful ways, and that is why Jesus said again, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is from far from me, and in vain, they do worship me. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, second lesson. Galatians 1, verse 10, For if I yet please man, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now look at what the Bible said during the conversation of Jesus and the lawyer. In verse 29 of Luke chapter 10, But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Now, we see here, when the lawyer inquired about who is his neighbor, he had in mind that Jesus would somehow point back to what he was doing for his fellow. Deep inside, his inquiry was actually meant for him, thinking that Jesus would probably praise him for what he is doing and thinking that Jesus will answer like, oh, the, the neighbors are your friends, and uh, the neighbors are, are your, 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 your family, and you are actually doing a great job. You're doing a great job. That's what I'm talking about. You're the man. But no. Because this man, he wanted to justify himself because reading between the lines, he was probably helping his friends. He was probably good at his friends. That's why... In the Bible said, but wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus because, again, Jesus wants him to point back to him. Oh, you're the man, lawyer. You're the man. But Jesus did not answer him like that. The answer of Jesus is not like that. In verse 15, and he said to them, in Luke 16, 15, I'm sorry. Luke 16, 15. In justifying this lawyer's act, in Luke 16, 15, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. Because this lawyer wanted to justify what he was doing because he wanted to Jesus, for Jesus to point back to him because he is pleasing men rather than God. You are those who justify yourselves before man, but God knows your heart. Jesus knew very well the heart of this person. When he asked Jesus Christ the question, he wants Jesus Christ to revert back to him. But no, Jesus Christ, knowing his heart, he did not say what he wanted to hear. You see, for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You know, human beings, my dear brethren, have this inclination of uh, wanting to have praise or, or uh, inclination towards praises of man. And sometimes we even, uh, we even go to the point of justifying our deeds, even though we know that we are wrong. And we want to be popular among men because we love to hear those praises. We love to have our, our shoulders Tapped by our uh, by our peers, see. But then again, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with praising our friends. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with tapping the backs of our friends because it encourages us. It it gives us self confidence. It boosts our morale. But again, God knows your heart. If you are doing that just to get the praises of man, then Jesus said. You are not worthy of me. Yes, you get the praise of man. You, you got their praises, but you will ne never get the praise of God. The problem with it is then we exchange. We exchange the truth for, 
for lies and we exchange the truth for the praises of men. When our hearts are, are set on what men will have to say rather than what God has to say. And people, sometimes we set our thoughts on what men will have to say to me, will, what men will have to say to you rather than what God will have to say to all of us. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, the whole uh, um, verse for that, the Bible said, For do I now persuade man or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please man, I should not be the servant of Christ. You see, you see this lawyer, all he wanted to hear was the praise of Jesus praising him. But Jesus never did that because he can see right through his heart. There is no room for servanthood, as the verse said, there's no room for servanthood for those who are going after the praises of man in the, in the kingdom of God. If we profess that we are Christians, but seek man's pleasure rather than God, then the Bible said we should not be called the servant of Christ. Lesson number three. In the Good Samaritan, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Matthew chapter 9, verse 13. Now, let's ask this question. In the Good Samaritan, there is a priest, a Levite. Now, the question is, why a priest and why a Levite? For so many years, I've been asking that question. Why a priest? Why a Levite? And why not a, a, a Roman, a, a soldier? Why not? No. Now, when Jesus said, to love your neighbors as yourself, he was quoting in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Okay. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, fellow Israelites, but you shall love your neighbor as yourselves. I am the Lord. In the immediate context of the word neighbors, as it was used in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, it was confined actually the word neighbors was actually confined to the fellow Israelites. It does not include some other races. That's why in, in Leviticus 19, 18, in the context of that, then the word neighbors was only refer, referred to the fellow Israelites. Okay? And it does, not, it does not apply to non-Israelites. So when Jesus tells this parable, it was just so fitting not to put someone like a Roman because the Jew or the lawyer would know that the Roma would not be a, 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 a neighbor because in the context, it was only for the fellow Israelites. So that's why Jesus never mentioned a Roman in, in, in the parable. So it was just fitting. And uh, it was also fitting that Jesus priest and the Levite as characters. Now, these are the reason why, because the priests, they actually came from the tribe of Levi. Not all, not all Levites are priests, but all priests comes from the tribe of Levi. So all priests are Levites. So that is why we can get and we can see why Jesus chosen or chose the priests and the Levites in the Good Samaritan story. Okay. Now, why did the priest, when he saw the Jew lying half dead, went by or went to the other side and passed by him? Why? Why did the priest did not help this Jew, his fellow Jew, actually? Now, one common reason is that the priests were given specific instructions in the Old Testament not to touch a dead body. Now, we can read that in Leviticus chapter 21, 1 and 3. None shall defy himself, none shall defile himself for the dead among his people, except 
or his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his brother, or his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother. So a priest, that is why the reason he went to the other side. That's why he did not help this person who was left on the road dying. Because probably he thought that this person is actually dead. He knew that he was not allowed to touch a dead corpse. So that's why. Okay. Now, <clears throat> okay. okay. Now, the other reason okay, why Jesus chose the priest as one character in the story was that the priest's role, especially in the Old Testament, they are a mediator. Okay, they are a mediator. They offer sacrifice. They sacrifice uh, on behalf for someone for their sins because the people back then, they cannot just do it by themselves. They need a priest to sacrifice for them. So by principle, a priest comes to an aid to help someone that are incapable and in dire need. So that's why Jesus uses the priest in the story. Now this particular priest, he may, have, he may not have forgotten this law. He may not have forgotten the law. That's why he did not help this Jew. But actually, he may have forgotten one thing. Because in the Jewish law, there is what they call pikwash nefesh. In the Jewish law, pikwash nefesh is the principle in the Jewish law that the preservation of human life, it overrides. It overrides virtually any other religious rule of Judaism. In the event that a person is in critical danger, most mitzvah, including those from the Ten Commandments of the Torah, become inapplicable if they would hinder the ability to save oneself or someone else in such a situation. However, there are certain exceptions. Now, the priest, knowing his role and knowing the limitations that he will not touch, he was commanded not to touch a dead core, he forgot about this rule in their law. That in the event that there is somebody needing help, then all laws become inapplicable. He would have therefore helped that person. Okay. But he did not. The priest did not. The priest's duty was to help his fellow Jew in need. Okay. But again, he chose not to. Now the second character, the Levite. Why the Levite? Now a priest would have come from the tribe of Levi, again, but not all, uh, uh, not all Levites are, are, are priests. Okay. Now, the Levites, they were actually teachers of the law in, in Deuteronomy chapter 33. And they were also known as a legal expert. Okay. So legal experts, just like the one that Jesus, to whom Jesus was talking to. Okay. The person Jesus was talking to, he was actually a law, a legal expert. And he was, uh, as some scholars would put it, a Jew. Okay. Now, as to why the Levite did not help his fellow Jew, the answer lies in what we discussed earlier regarding the praises of man. It is because, just like this lawyer, he was after the praises of man. And this particular Levite, a lawyer, a teacher of the law, when he saw that dead or half dead man, a fellow Jew, and he was probably looking and there's nobody there to see his good deeds, nobody dead to praise him, then he passed by this uh, fellow Jew. But if there would be somebody, if there would be someone in the same area, then probably he, he would have helped his fellow Jew and he would have received his praises. So that's one reason why the Levite did not help this fellow Jew, because there's no one there to praise him. And mind you, this person, the Levite, 
He is an expert in the law. He knows also the law. But he never helped this person. Now, seeing nobody would praise him, he just turned a blind eye and walked past by his fellow Jew. Now, the priest and the Levite, they represent a world that is born and raised you know, with the spiritual nourishment. They are actually, they know the law. So they represent a world that are born with the spiritual nourishment and knowledge. And yet, with all their vast knowledge, with all their vast experiences, years of experiences in serving the temples, they fail in God. When Jesus said he wants mercy, not sacrifice, Jesus wants us to let go of the idea of sacrifice. Things that we perceive as religious, and Jesus wants us to pursue mercy. Now, the Samaritans, this good Samaritan, he could have easily passed by the Jew. Because he has no obligation whatsoever to the Jew. But compassion. He had compassion on his fellow. He had mercy. Because it was the right thing to do. When he saw a fellow human being, he was not thinking about, he's a Jew, I am a Samaritan, and we don't share the same plate. We don't even drink on the same uh, cup. Why would I help him? He did not. But compassion creeps into his heart because that's the right thing to do. For him, that is what religion is all about. Just like our Lord Jesus Christ, when we, when you and I, when we are incapable of helping ourselves, Jesus Christ came to our aid. He died for your behalf. He died on my behalf because I cannot do it by myself. And when this person lying half dead, when nobody cared for him, even his own, the Samaritan came to his aid because it was the right thing to do. You know, when, when the Pharisees criticized Jesus for befriending or uh, befriending the sinners. He explained to them the very words of God. He said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. When the Pharisees criticized him for allowing his disciples to harvest grain on the Sabbath, when, the, when, the, when his disciples were harvesting grains during the Sabbath, the Pharisees, they criticized Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus Christ explained himself the same way. He said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now, in those instances where, where Jesus mentioned those words, he was showing his very heart to all of us. He was showing who he is. He is showing to all of us what he represents. And for us not to see the meaning of these very words of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's like we are a blind servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus Christ uttered those words, he was referring to the act of love. When Jesus said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, he was referring to the act of love. Because God is love, according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Now, what flows out of God's deepest heart is actually love. Now, in the same way, he was telling all of us, through this parable, that each one of us should must act out of love. Let us not let us let go of what uh, our so-called religion. Let us let go of our so-called being legalist and act out of love, because it is the right thing to do. God wants our hearts so much to be involved in showing mercy that the word sacrifice will never be in our minds anymore. Now, passion to love other people as he passionately loved you and I. Mercy that, is that, mercy that is not judgmental. Mercy and not retribution. Mercy that is genuinely compassionate. Mercy that depends the innocent. Mercy that heals brokenness. Mercy that brings heaven a little closer to man. That is what God wants us to do. A question, 
Whom do you expect to help you first in your dire need? Answer it in your mind. Whom do you expect to help you first in your dire need? Letter A, is it your family, your church family, or your biological family? B, your friends. Letter C, a stranger. I'm just guessing every one of us would go for A, right? They are the ones that we expect to help us first in our dire needs. Next lesson, Proverbs 3, 27. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. Now comes the Samaritan. Enter the Samaritan. The Samaritans and the Jews, as I've said, they, they never see eye to eye. <clears throat> now, some interesting facts about the Samaritan in the story. It suggests that somehow this Samaritan was a businessman because the route that they took was somehow, it is a, 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 a route, a business route during that time. Second, he was a well-off man because he has the money to pay for the Jews' in and medications. Number three, the fact that the innkeeper took the Samaritan's word for paying him back for whatever damages would cause him in taking care of the Jew suggests that this Samaritan had what I call a face value or a credit value, right? which probably he was known to the area. He was probably known to the area and probably would frequent the inn. That's why when he told the innkeeper, I will come back and pay whatever damages that he would incur. And the innkeeper accept his words. So some of the facts. Now, I think that the Jew would be more heartbroken if he learns that his fellow neighbors, the priests and the Levites who were both from the same tribe, did not help him. When, he would, when, when this person would probably wake up and learning that his fellow did not help him, it would probably hurt. Right? Like putting a dagger to the heart. What? My fellow did not help me out? And this guy, a stranger, a complete stranger, did all these things. Right. And again, an enemy took care of him. Now, the same thing that we will all feel if our so-called family turns their back on us when we are broken down. That is human nature. Of all people, the Samaritan came to his rescue and saved him. Now, what do you think that the Jew now feels about this good Samaritan? What do you now feel? This Jew have the, for, for this Samaritan. Now, I will tell you what he feels. The Jew will now have a lot of respect for the Samaritan. He will have a lot of respect. Okay. Now, the second, the Jew would have learned humility. Humility to ask for forgiveness. Why? Forgiveness because for so long, they thought that the Samaritans were a no good people. That the Samaritans, they were the enemies. But no, lo and behold, a Samaritan came to his aid. And the Samaritan would have taught him humility. And third, he would have learned what love, compassion, mercy is all about. It's that what Jesus is all about. Love, mercy, compassion. Forgiveness. Is not that what Christianity is all about? Love, mercy, compassion, forgiveness. And that love goes beyond ethnicity. Love goes beyond color. Love goes beyond race. And love goes beyond social status. Now, as we must learn from these lessons, we are learning a lot from the Samaritan, uh, the Good Samaritan. Now, Jesus explained or expanded. He expanded the boundaries of who, our, who are our neighbors. He was telling the lawyer that our neighbors include everybody, not only those who came from the same race as we are, or those we choose to be our neighbors or our family alone. We must be like the Samaritan living in the statement of Proverbs chapter 3, verses 27 and 28, 
Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. Do not tell your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I will provide. When you already have the means. We bring heaven, my dear brethren, a little closer to man by being the good Samaritan in the lives of our neighbors. The neighbor in verse 28 of Proverbs chapter 3 means everybody. It is, not, it is now no longer confined to the Israelites. God knows if you have the means to help your fellow, you know, you cannot hide it from God. We might say again and again to our fellow that, you know, I don't have the means to help you. But God can see right through your heart. That's why God said, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power to do so. And finally, God said, I will bless those who bless you. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. The good Samaritan is about blessing. It's about blessing other people. Now, one thing that is overlooked in the, in the parable is how the Samaritan used his material possessions to help out this Jew. Now, as we can see, they are not in any way related to each other, but this, this particular Samaritan helped out the Jew using his resources. Now, I would like to us to see ourselves from a different perspective, how we use our resources. In Romans chapter 14, verse 7, for we don't live for ourselves. Paul tells us that we don't live. You don't live for yourself. God called us to be his servants, to be the salt, to be the light of the earth. Therefore, we are to be a blessing for somebody else. You must see yourself in the light of how God calls you or how God called you to be his servant, to be the sight, uh, to be the salt and the light of the world, to become a blessing for other people. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, look into your hearts, look into yourself why God puts you to where you are. Because I do believe that God puts you where you are because God will use you mightily. You are where you are because God has a purpose for you. Your life is your life today because God has a purpose for you. Because you will become a blessing to other people. Many people, I have, I have seen and I have talked to so many people during my lifetime. They complain about, you know, Brother Mike, I'm, I think I'm not blessed by God. Even Christians, they say that they are not blessed by God. Because they compare themselves to other people. You know, the moment, my dear brethren and friends, the moment you compare yourself to other people, is the moment you lose track of your own blessings. The moment you look to other people for their blessings, it closes your mind to what God has blessed you so much. And I do believe every one of us are blessed by God. We are just blessed in, so deep, in, in many different ways, I would say. But God, look at the Samaritan. The Samaritan used his blessings to be a blessing for other people. Just like what God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. If you would be able to bless one person, God said, I will bless you more. I will bless you. Why? So that you could bless two more individuals. If you are able to bless two individuals, the Lord said, I will bless you. Why? So that you could bless three more individuals. And the cycle goes on and on and on and on. I have seen that in my life. I have seen that in my life. We cannot outdo God when it comes to generosity. We cannot outdo God when it comes to blessings. Because all that we have comes from Him. Amen. The Samaritan, he used his blessing to bless this Jew. He acted on what is right. And that's why this very moment, I believe that God will continue to bless you because you continue to become a blessing for others. The question now is, are you a neighbor? Are you 
enabled. In the conversation between the Jesus and the Jew and the lawyer, the lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? You know, the question of the lawyer is a question looking for the self whom he is obligated to help. Looking for the self. Now, Jesus okay, paraphrases the question of this lawyer. You see, the question of the lawyer, who is my neighbor? It is a, a, a question centered on us. Who is my neighbor? Again, look at what Jesus said. He paraphrases the question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Jesus paraphrases the question of the lawyer. It is not now centered on us, but centered on the person in need. The question centers on the person in need, but scrutinizing and looking in to ourselves. There's a big difference between knowing who our neighbors, the question of the lawyer, there is a big difference between knowing who our neighbors are and being a neighbor to our neighbor in need. And that is what the question of Jesus Christ is. I hope that we see the point of our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, Jesus said to the lawyer, and Jesus is telling us, go and do likewise. Christianity, my dear brethren, is first and foremost loving God with all our hearts, and loving our neighbors as well. It is my prayer that as we go through with our life, we can see the blessings of God in our lives and bring heaven a little closer to our fellow. Finally, let me leave you with this final verse in James chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. That's why God said, oh, sorry. Go and do likewise. Now, the message of God is ours for anybody needing prayers and other things that you need that the church can help you, that the church can help you. Please let us know. Those who want to accept our Lord Jesus Christ and receive the forgiveness of your sins, please come forward. There's water right here. The song of invitation is for everybody and for those who want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? <laughs>